This is Blood and Cancer, the official podcast of MDH Hematology slash Oncology, where we discuss the latest research, treatment considerations, and other issues related to hematology and oncology. Welcome to this podcast. I'm your host, Dr. David Henry. You're listening to Blood and Cancer, a weekly podcast for practitioners in the clinical world of our wonderful hematology oncology specialty and bringing you each week topics and discussions of interest. And I'm delighted today to be speaking with Dr. Glenn Pierce, who is Vice President Medical, World Federation of Hemophilia. And uh, where are you? Uh, I am based primarily in La Jolla, California. Mm -hmm. Lucky you. So from the East Coast, we're just starting to see the, the blossoms and we're, we're very jealous. But we want to take advantage of your hemophilia experience and we're going to rapidly get into gene therapy. But um, maybe I want to clear up a couple of things first. When I'm in training, we have hemophilia A, factor 8, hemophilia B, factor 9, hemophilia C, factor 11, I think was called that for a while, but it's autosomal recessive and A and B, 8 and 9 are X-linked. And I've always wanted to know, didn't Queen Victoria have carry the gene and populate half of Europe with what? Was she A or B? Well, it turns out she was hemophilia B, although for many years we all thought it was hemophilia A because that's more prevalent. However, when the Tsarevich Alexis was, uh, his remains were found back in the early uh, aughts, uh, he was, uh, his D, uh, DNA was sequenced and it was found that he had hemophilia B, uh, a variant that gave him severe hemophilia B. Uh, and so all of Europe then that got populated was populated with hemophilia B. Because the royals used to marry each other to prevent war and she contributed a lot of royal offspring. Well, now, of course, the hemophilia B factor nine is called Christmas disease because of the holiday. True? Not true. Uh, it is uh, called Christmas disease after Mr. Christmas, the, uh, uh, the primary case uh, for which it was actually diagnosed. Fascinating. I didn't know that. Well, let's get into our topic today of, of hemophilia. And so maybe if you could explain a bit how come you come to be such an expert in hemophilia, and then we'll start to dive into the details of gene therapy. Well, it all started a very long time ago. I was born with severe hemophilia A. Uh, and I had a childhood in which there really was no effective treatment. It was before cryoprecipitate had been identified and used for uh, controlling bleeding episodes. So I spent much of my childhood in the hospital. Doctors became my role models, and I figured if you couldn't beat them, join them. And it was my goal to learn as much about my disease as I possibly could. And the logical route to that was uh, to go to medical school. I also, during medical school, became very interested in research and did an MD-PhD program at Case Western Reserve uh, and um, got involved as a volunteer with hemophilia. I uh, became a board member of the National Hemophilia Foundation uh, back in 1984, just uh, during the AIDS crisis within hemophilia uh, and um, I worked in tissue repair, uh, actually, um, as my professional career, started it at Amgen uh, and went on and started a gene therapy tissue repair company in San Diego. At a certain point though, I realized that hemophilia was my true passion. And so back in 2002, I did a mid-career uh, switch and uh, took over as the head of an R&D program at a company called Avigen in South San Francisco, actually in, the, uh, in Alameda, California, in the Bay yeah. Area, um, that was working on hemophilia B gene therapy. Uh, and uh, once I did that, um, there was no turning back. I have continued over these years, these 20 years or so, to work in hemophilia on protein engineered drugs. I've been involved in the development of five different protein engineered drugs that are now on the market, uh, as well as um, um, getting involved in gene therapy, which has yet to make it to the market. Well, let's get right into that. What a great story. So if we get right into that gene therapy, so of course, there's just one thing wrong in our hemophilia A and B carried on the X gene, along with G6PD and uh, colorblindness. So if you could turn that around and make it express that gene, everything would be okay. So 
how would gene therapy, what is your work and your research and understanding what others are doing developed into a gene therapy? How would it work? Well, it sounds disarmingly simple, um, but um, behind that simplicity is a very complex procedure. Um, the simplicity is what you said. It's a monogenic defect, single gene defect uh, variant. Uh, and um, if that could be replaced uh, or augmented then uh, with a normal gene, uh, then theoretically hemophilia could be cured. Uh, and so the gene therapy we're talking about is the very basic gene therapy that really means gene addition. We're adding a normal gene to the variant uh, in an individual in order to provide protein um, transcript uh, from, the, um, from the normal gene to correct the cladding factor deficiency. So that's the simplicity of it. Uh, the complexity of it is really in the delivery. How do we get that normal gene into the body in order to make a sufficient amount of protein to be able to have a therapeutic effect on the individual with hemophilia? And that's where the hurdles have been. That's where the barriers have been over the last uh, more than 20 years since hemophilia gene therapy has gone into the clinic. Well, now, is it similar in this, co as you're talking, I'm thinking in this COVID era, the scientists learned to take a messenger RNA to make spike protein, get it from your arm, not digest it, make it travel to the protein making cells and hijack their mechanism at the ribosome level, I guess, and turn out spike protein. Is this technology similar? In many ways, it is similar. Uh, and the reason that mRNA hasn't been used as a vaccine before is because of the delivery issues, getting enough of the mRNA to the right cells for the right amount of time to make enough protein to get an immune response. And that's been solved um, by the companies that are now um, marketing the vaccine very effectively. Mm -hmm. So, but that's a temporary situation and we're looking to generate an immune response. Oh, right. the, the COVID protein doesn't last very long, but it lasts long enough to make an immune response. In our situation, we need to have a, uh, the ability to have a long-term long effect, a potentially lifelong effect. In order to do that, we have employed viruses uh, to deliver the gene. And the virus that is emerged as the favorite is one called adeno-associated virus, or AAV. It doesn't have anything to do with adenovirus other than it was found associated with it a long time ago, 30 mm -hmm. some, 40 some years ago. Um, but it is a very tiny virus that doesn't cause any disease in us when we get infected, um, but can um, be used to deliver genes to a variety of different cells in the body, including the liver. They would stay there. So once they got there, as you point out, the COVID production goes away. So they would get there, stay there, and keep producing. It will because we use DNA, not messenger RNA. And the DNA is established within the virus to be able, once it gets into the cell, to set up a permanent circular piece of DNA that is in the nucleus that is stable to any DNAs, DNAs. So it can't be destroyed. It remains there in a stable form, uh, extra chromosomal, but for a very long period of time in animals. The question in humans is how long will it last? And those are questions that are being actively investigated now. And these are, you're targeting liver cells to infect them, make them keep uh, the DNA. And I guess maybe from time to time, you might need a booster if, uh, if that for some reason that capsid decays. Well, and that's a problem because we make a huge immune response to the AAV. We are injecting more AAV than we have cells in the body. So more than E13, E14 vector genomes um, are being injected into patients. Uh, and so the immune response uh, is substantial and it lasts for decades. So if this is a one-shot deal. We've not solved that problem yet. And that means that it has to work. Otherwise, the patient isn't going to be able to take a second dose of even a related virus. Interesting. Now, A and B, factor eight, factor nine, is there a difference in the technique you have to employ to make those patients respond? 
Uh, no, there's not. Uh, the technique is the same. It's AAV delivering either the factor nine gene or AAV delivering the factor eight gene. Um, where the differences are, are the results that are coming out of the, uh, the clinical trials. Uh, and those are somewhat different between hemophilia B and hemophilia A. They have similarities and differences. So then let's go there. So in your research in A and B, you can lump them together if you like, or separate if necessary. What are the phase three trials? Where are they, their status, and what are they showing? Um, two of the phase three trials, one for hemophilia B, one for hemophilia A, have released uh, data in the last uh, three to four months. Uh, and what they show, they both show that a number of patients have therapeutic levels of factor nine or factor eight, um, greatly decreased or eliminated bleeding episodes, breakthrough bleeding episodes, um, the greatly diminished or eliminated need for factor eight or factor nine replacement, no longer on prophylaxis with recombinant proteins. Uh, and so in that sense, they are, it's a remarkable achievement. Many patients are doing well. And, and for all intents and purposes, could be considered free, uh, free of factor eight, here free of factor nine, and potentially um, I would use the C word, cured of their wow. hemophilia, at least for a period of time. What kinds of levels, if I remember my hemophilia numbers, less than 1%, you're severe and you're a bleeder, one to five, and then uh, five and over, 10 and over, not, and sometimes you don't even know you have it. What kinds of levels are you achieving? Most of the patients are getting into the moderate, greater than 5%, um, uh, greater than, actually, moderate is greater than 1%. Um, mild is greater than 5%. Uh, and so most patients are actually getting into the moderate, mild range. Many patients get into the mild range. A few patients are getting into the normal range, which is greater than um, uh, 50%. Wow. So there's no free lunch. What um downside or side effect or adverse events have you seen? Uh, the largest side effect are mild increases in transaminases that often are accompanied by loss of the transgene. So loss of the factor eight or factor nine. And uh, in early work that we did when I was at Avigen in collaboration with investigators actually at CHOP in Philadelphia, uh, as well as Stanford, um, we were able to show that, um, that we made a cytotoxic T cell response to the viral capsid peptides that were displayed on the surface of the hepatocytes in the context of HLA class one. This is exactly what happens in a viral infection. Viruses infect cells, the virus coat gets chewed up within the cells, it gets captured by various HLA molecules displayed on the surface stimulate cytotoxic T cells, cytotoxic T cells bind to the cell and destroy the cell. So we found that that happened um, in the patients with factor IX deficiency, hemophilia B, in our, in our early uh, Avigen clinical trial. That shut the field down for a period of time until investigators at University College London and St. Jude's decided to use prednisone to dampen the immune response. And it was remarkably effective at knocking down the transaminase levels and preserving the factor nine. And so now most everyone is trying to figure out how to optimally use the prednisone, prophylactically, reactively. Uh, and for factor nine, um, the reactive use seems to have been pretty effective in managing, managing the uh, transaminase elevations, maintaining factor nine. Uh, and I think that there's a reasonable expectation that the risk reward um, is a reasonable one for factor nine, and this will march toward um, um, regulatory uh, toward the regulatory process to determine if it's safe and effective uh, for approval. So interesting, you know, in our checkpoint inhibitors, our nivolumabs and our uh, pembrolizumabs, if uh, off-target effect occurs, I tell patients you're going to get an itis. Um, off target might be a pneumonitis, colitis, dermatitis, and we can tap that down with prednisone. So the immune system seems to have a little built-in antidote sometimes, which uh, you found in your work as well. So um, tell me, I believe there's a registry. So how do people there, access there, the information, get involved with what you're doing, and maybe send patients to you? 
there is a registry, but let me just mention first the difference with factor eight. Um, with factor eight, it's a much more variable response that patients get, including a few patients that don't get a response at all. Uh, and there's a loss of there's a loss of factor eight, um, at least in the clinical trials that we have seen to, um, that have released data to date. Um, it's a long-term loss over a period of years, um, but the reasons for that are completely unknown. So that's where there's a dichotomy between the results with factor nine, results with factor eight. Some patients who uh, receive the AAV factor eight need to be um, on um, uh, on therapy for um, on prednisone therapy for a period of years, uh, and so in that case, um, um, that that's a potential problem. Yet the science well, and the and the experiment they're the same. So the difference is simply the gene. Uh, it is the difference. It is the difference. And factor eight is a very large gene. It's difficult yes, right. to put into the AAV vector. It's difficult for cells to make it um, as well, and so. I think we have more to learn about factor eight um, and it's it, the responses that we all make to that um, as we go forward. But there's a lot of investigation in the area. Do I remember of, the, of our clotting factors, eight is the one not entirely made in the liver, it's made elsewhere. Well, it's made in the sinusoidal endothelial cells, um, primarily in the liver. There is some evidence that um, endothelial cells in the lung, the spleen can make a little bit but a liver transplant will cure both hemophilia B and hemophilia A. Yeah, indeed, of course, yeah. So, all right, let's get on to some practicalities. Uh, this is exciting stuff, and it sounds like you're well on the way to developing something. This will just be earth-shattering, groundbreaking. Registry, clinical trials, how could clinicians and or patients access this information and get to you if they want to be involved in clinical trials. Are you one place or are you nationwide? So how broad? Well, it's, it's, it's way beyond me. It, you know, there are many companies that are involved in clinical trials. And so one immediate source is clinicaltrials.gov, mm -hmm. which does identify the companies involved in hemophilia A, hemophilia B clinical trials. Um, at the World Federation of Hemophilia, where I'm the volunteer vice president for medical, um, we also um, publish frequently on the results of clinical trials, who's doing what. We hold a number of workshops and meetings. I also work with the U.S. National Hemophilia Foundation and uh, run a workshop on gene therapy and new technologies where we look at, at preclinical assets or people that are working in academics or in biotech companies that are working on the next thing. You know, what's the improvement to AAV gene therapy? How else can we solve this puzzle? What other vectors can we use? How else can we get a piece of DNA into the human body? And so lots of activity in that area, uh, and it's all being reported on by these organizations. So I, I can't risk asking the technology, you know, I mentioned COVID, and you mentioned this to hijack a protein production of the body, in this case the liver, have you found any spinoffs or potential applications to um, something else? Are, are rare genetic diseases missing this or that protein? Um, there are a lot of lessons to be learned for other monogenic diseases. Um, in, you know, in many ways, it's a bit of a cookbook. Um, what you learn about the promoters, the regulatory elements, of making the gene transcribe messenger RNA and go on to make protein, um, those are universal in many ways and can be applied to many other monogenic diseases. It's just that there's been a lot of work, um, clinical work, preclinical work in hemophilia. Um, but that's not to say that, that the same learnings can't be applied and aren't being applied to many other monogenic diseases. Well, then where are you and, the, and this whole field of research with regard to FDA approval? Can I order this up next month? Not quite. Um, the, um, I think we're probably um, a year, year and a half at the earliest away from, uh, from an FDA or an EMA approval. Um, uh, the front runners are finished with their phase three clinical studies. They're preparing their dossiers for the regulatory agencies. Uh, and then it's generally an eight to 12 month process, could be longer depending upon the questions that are asked. Um, before um, approval would be granted. 
Incredible. What, what would you say is the magnitude of the problem? How many men do we have with hemophilia A and B symptomatic or needing this kind of help in the US, for example? Um, when we talk about severe disease, we've probably got on the order of 10,000 uh, in the US with hemophilia A and B. Um, and um, it's important to appreciate that, that there are a lot of inclusion and exclusion criteria that go um, with, the, with the use of gene therapy. If we have previously been exposed to the AAV vector that's being used, we may have antibodies to it, which yeah. will preclude us from being able to take that gene therapy. Um, if we've had active liver disease, um, which many in our community have had hepatitis B, have had hepatitis C for decades, many, many decades. Or HIV. If that's the liver disease, then you're probably, you may be excluded from, uh, from some gene therapy. And so evaluations for liver health are important as well. Okay. Well, I guess as we draw to a close, I know we talked offline about what we don't know, we don't know. Are there any unknowns that you're thinking of so you have to surmount or do you not quite know the unknowns we don't know? Well, we know about some of the unknowns and other unknowns are unknown uh, to paraphrase. And so uh, gene therapy is a brand new technology. It's a brand new modality. It will eventually be a part of the armamentarium along with small molecules and proteins, monoclonal antibodies, cell therapy. Uh, but in the case of gene therapy, um, we don't know the long-term effects because it hasn't been here long enough for us to appreciate. We do know that it's relatively safe. Uh, we haven't seen um, um, much in the way of toxicity with a couple of notable exceptions, for instance, with adenovirus. But, but for AAV, it's been, it's been a safe drug um, with the exception of these transaminase elevations. We don't know the long-term effects of that though. We don't know the long-term effects of a small amount of integration into the chromosomes. So far, it's not been a problem. But that's part of where a registry comes in to be able to monitor and manage patients over the long term and identify the uh, the, the potential risks of the of the new modality. So the websites where listeners might go, for example, the registry or to get updates on this research, can you name a site or two where listeners might go? I can. Um, www.wfh.org for the World Federation of Hemophilia and www.hemophilia.org for the U.S. National Hemophilia Foundation would be excellent places to start and then to look for the gene therapy material. The other place that has a lot of gene therapy material is the International Society of Thrombosis Hemostasis. I do yeah. a lot of educational work with them as well. They have a number of webinars on the basics of gene therapy also, and that's isph.org. I can't thank you enough. We've been speaking with Dr. Glenn Pierce, Vice President Medical, World Federation of Hemophilia, a really sterling scientist in an exciting field. And um, thank you for joining us today and for all the work you do. Uh, you can listen to this on Blood and Cancer, your podcast, also at the webpage, mdh.com slash hematology-oncology, where again, the bullet points and show notes will be listed. And thanks again, Glenn, for joining us today. Thank you, David. This has been a fun conversation. I've enjoyed it too. Blood and Cancer is produced by MD Edge. Our editor is Jen Smith. All MD Edge podcasts are produced by executive editor Kathy Scarbeck, and I'm your host, Dr. David Henry. <laughs>